Welcome and thank you for joining us for this On Aging Conversation. My name is Barbara McMillan and I'm Provincial Community Education Coordinator for United Way British Columbia's Healthy Aging Team. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional ancestral territories of all First Nations in this land we now call Canada and on which we gratefully work and gather. The On Aging Conversation series is a collaboration between Healthy Aging Corps and Help Age Canada. If you missed earlier episodes, you'll find them on Apple Podcasts and on Healthy Aging Core Canada, the national knowledge hub connecting agencies that support and advance independent living for older Canadians. You'll also find the lineup of on aging speakers on Core, as well as delivered to your inbox if you've signed up for the twice monthly Core e news. And you can do that at www.healthyagingcore.ca. In our work with CORE, HelpAge, and the extraordinary network of community-based senior-serving agencies, volunteers, and professionals across Canada, we are privileged to encounter many thought leaders and innovators in the field of healthy aging. And so On Aging Conversations was launched to help bring some of these ideas, innovations, and perspectives to a wider audience. And that's it. A 30-minute conversation with a featured guest providing healthy aging information, ideas, and inspiration every two weeks. And now I'll turn it over to Gregor Snedden, CEO of HelpAge Canada, your host for On Aging. Thanks, Barb, and welcome to everyone. HelpAge Canada supports community-based initiatives through its partnerships across Canada and abroad to improve the lives of older persons and their communities. And I'm actually today speaking with you from Dominica, a small island, a nature island where Pirates of the Caribbean was shot. One of their claims to fame here in the Southern Caribbean, where we operate a sponsor, a grandparent program. And it's a real privilege for me today to have this opportunity to introduce to you and to speak with Heather Cowie. And Heather Cowie is the manager and community engagement officer at the Alzheimer's Society of BC and the national project manager for Dementia Friendly Canada. Canada. Heather has her MA in gerontology from Simon Fraser University, where she specialized in aging and the built environment. She previously worked as the strategic lead and provincial coordinator for the Dementia Friendly Communities Initiative at the Alzheimer's Society of BC for over seven years. And she's excited to be bringing attention to dementia friendly communities across the country and helping people understand the actions they can take to build them. So it's a real privilege. Welcome to On Aging, Heather. Thank you, Gregor, for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Awesome. Now, as you know, I'm here in Dominica and you are in Vancouver, but as I understand, you are originally from Port Coquitlam, the home of Terry Fox. That is our claim to fame. Yes, we are very (laughs) proud to say that he is our hero. We have statues to him everywhere. Oh, that's fantastic. There was a great one in Ottawa as well. So great to be in such great company. (laughs) Tell us, Heather, a little bit about how you, you know, where you, so you're a BC gal and uh, how did you come into this field? Obviously, you've dedicated a big portion of your life to the issues of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. How did you arrive there? What's your story? Absolutely. I I think like everyone, I was in university trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I grow up. And I was talking to my best friend's mom, actually. And she said, Heather, you've always enjoyed working with older adults and you're so close to your grandparents. and You have that, you know, spirit. Have you considered gerontology? So I, I went home that night and I signed up for gerontology courses, awesome. made it my minor, did my graduate degree in it. And I, I was really excited in my first gerontology class because I went in excited, but I yeah. went in and it was about the built environment and we were allowed to do an audit of someone's home. And I, I picked my grandparents and I went in to see if it ah. was considered age friendly and it, it, it wasn't, but I could see the pride and the happiness that they saw in that home. And I really connected for me that I wanted to make sure that I could create places where people were able to age in place and to age in a place that they considered their home, their community. And my grandmother was later diagnosed with brain cancer. So I saw a lot of those changes that you experience with dementia and how that can impact your ability to age in place. So when I I saw an opening at the Alzheimer's Society to help create dementia-friendly communities, I jumped at it. And I'm so lucky to have been here for almost seven years in creating these things. Fantastic. Well, wow. Well, Canada's lucky to have you in the chair. Glad, you know, glad way open for you and you've arrived. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Aging in place is such a key issue for aging in general right across Canada. You know, it's a real theme that I know Core Canada and Healthy Aging BC, Healthy Aging Alberta, Help Age Canada, we're all working hard at finding ways to allow older people to age in place. But wow, it brings in a whole new dimension and a whole other light when you talk about dementia and Alzheimer's. So I think a lot of people often get the, these terms confused. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about like what dementia and Alzheimer's, like what's the difference? 
difference? Are they the same thing? What, tell us a little bit about what, how are they different? Absolutely. I think it's the number one question we get at the Alzheimer's Society. What is the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? And it's a great question. So dementia is really that umbrella term for any disease that causes physical changes in the brain. So Alzheimer's disease is one type of dementia. And there are, there are okay. many types of dementia, such as Lewy body, frontal temporal, and each one affects individuals differently, but they're all are also a lot of common signs and symptoms. And so it can affect your behavior, personality, judgment. And so while each dementia affects people differently, dementia itself affects everyone differently. So we often say, if you know one person living with dementia, you know one person living with dementia. Right, right. Everyone's unique. It affects everybody differently. Everyone is their own individual. Well, and I also, you know, Alzheimer's is a fairly, it, it, there is, it doesn't have a lot of runway in terms of it's, it's being studied, it's the, the fullness of our understanding of it, it doesn't go into remission. Where are we at in terms of the research around Alzheimer's and dementia for that matter? Any, can you comment on that at all? Like, I would not want to say that I am the expert in the research happening on dementia right now. I know we're making lots of strides, not only in finding cures and and ways to help you prevent, but also creating quality of life studies. Research on quality of life for people living with dementia is definitely growing. And I have a number of great colleagues who work in dementia-friendly research who I'd love to connect you with for a future podcast. Oh, that sounds exciting. (laughs) Let's take note of that for sure. What are some of the challenges that people, caregivers, I know even here on this trip in Dominica, for example, where when we visit older people with dementia, you're immediately, well, and anywhere for that matter, but you immediately see the scope of vulnerability, especially at later stages, the acute need of caregivers. And even that time when family members say are really just not equipped anymore to, to fully support that person. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about what are some of the challenges that people caregivers face and and maybe a little bit even about that journey the first stage of discovery and as it progresses what does that kind of look like yeah I think when we're looking particularly at the dementia friendly communities work that I do we know that there's like 500,000 Canadians living with dementia and that number is growing and we know that 60 percent of those individuals live at home and in the community so they're living with a care partner they're living on their own and so they're still wanting to access their local library recreation facilities go out for coffee with friends and be able to access public transportation to get around. So even as they start noticing smaller changes again in their memory or behavior, they're still out in the community. And one of the biggest issues that they and their care partners face is stigma. We did a, there was a large ledger led survey by the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, uh, I believe in 2017, and 46% of Canadians said they would feel ashamed or embarrassed if they had dementia. 61% felt that they would probably face discrimination if they told people they were living with dementia. And we heard from 87% of caregivers that they wish people knew more about the realities of caring for someone living with dementia. So I think it's really just, yeah, that stigma and misunderstanding that limits people's ability to really engage in their community as much as they would like. Well, you know, one of the facts that's on your website there is that by 2030, close to a million people in Canada will be living with dementia, which is that's a big number. Tell us a little bit about the Dementia Friendly Canada Project, because I understand that's a key way Canada is preparing to create communities, a society that's inclusive and supportive of older people living with dementia. Absolutely. So taking even just a step back, you've mentioned age-friendly communities a couple of times. And for anyone listening who knows about age-friendly communities, dementia-friendly communities are just that one step further, adding that extra huh. lens on age-friendly work that's happening to create inclusive, supportive communities. And they focus on the physical and the social environment. So uh, when we're looking at physical characteristics. We're often looking at the built environment and how can we make sure that a person living with dementia is able to wayfind around their local library, make sure signage is clear. How do we know that in an age-friendly community, we recommend seating across a path? You know, you want to make sure you have a bench, a person can sit, they can rest. In a dementia-friendly community, we want to add that extra lens of does the bench look like a bench? So for a person living with dementia, sometimes an abstract piece of art can be seen as beautiful, but not necessarily a place you're going to go sit and relax. So we need to always... (laughs) Think about those extra things, you know, have the beautiful piece of art, but have a bench that looks like your standard bench along a park side so that a person living with dementia can sit and relax and look Uh at the beautiful piece of art. And then the social environment, again, goes back to that stigma and wanting everyone to learn about dementia. And so with the Dementia Friendly Canada Project, it's really a partnership between Alzheimer's societies across our country to create dementia friendly communities and to build on the resources that we're working on and to collaborate and partner to make sure that people living with dementia and their care partners do have that feeling of being included, feeling supported and feeling welcomed wherever they go. 
Well, I know that part of the strategy also that I found really exciting also is that to really include the voices of people living with dementia in the development of the project. So utilizing that lived experience and as we like to say, nothing for us without us. That was really great that that you guys were acknowledging that. And I was really curious, how are you going about doing that? What's the process of hearing those voices? I mean, it's critical that everything we do at the Alzheimer's Society and as part of the Dementia Friendly Canada Project is guided by lived experience. So for Dementia Friendly Canada, what we did is we held 12 in-person and online focus groups at the start of the project. That was our first step. And they were held with people living with dementia, care partners, and professionals in the target sectors that Dementia Friendly Canada hopes to connect with, which are people working in libraries, recreation facilities, retail, restaurant, and public transportation spaces. And we simply asked them, what does a dementia-friendly community mean to you? And what are some ways we can make these spaces more accommodating and accessible? And so from there, that has really led the creation of all of our tools. So if you do head to our webpage, you'll see Building Dementia-Friendly Communities, which is a free online course, which is for those audiences I previously listed. And it speaks to different scenarios and ways they can make their workplace more dementia-friendly. So there's four modules. What is a dementia-friendly community? Gives you a little bit more in-depth idea of what that means and what the concept of a dementia-friendly community is. Uh, Dementia-friendly interactions, which really goes into that social environment and communication tips and strategies for you to use when working with a person living with dementia. Dementia Dementia-friendly spaces, which highlights, again, physical environmental pieces you can change, such as the benches and the signage. And then dementia-friendly policies, practices, and services for organizations, which gives you ideas of how you can adapt your workplace. And all of the examples throughout that course come directly from those focus groups. Plus, we had people with lived experience go through the course once it was done to make sure that the examples that were provided in there, as well as the solutions or proposed changes that we recommended, were things that were actually going to be beneficial for them out in the real world. You mentioned their communication strategies. Can you give some examples of, of what are dementia-friendly communication strategies? So if you're speaking with someone who's maybe showing some signs of dementia or who has let you know that they're living with dementia, there are certain things you can do. Speak slowly and clearly. I have a tendency to speak really fast. That's my natural pace. Like I've just had four coffees, but really taking your time one sentence at a time to allow the person to absorb the information. Also allowing that time for response. You know, sometimes we all become a little uncomfortable if there's a five second pause. So not jumping on the person, they don't answer right away. And one of the big ones when it comes to the environment is, is it really busy? Are you in the middle of a recreation center and there's kids running around and there's the echoes of things happening down the halls? That can be hard for a person living with dementia to focus. Uh, So is there a quieter space or room that you can go have that conversation in? And then the biggest one is really to respond to feelings and to connect with the individual, not correct them. Sometimes you need to really make sure you're actively listening because what they're saying may not align with what they're trying to convey to you. So to really just be patient Mm -hmm. and to recognize their frustration is because they're living in their reality, which may be slightly different than yours. So, you know, highlighting that you see that they're frustrated and you want to sort this out and just, again, taking time to really engage with them and see them as the person that they are, the individual that they are. You know, they're Gregor, they're Barbara, they're Heather. And I noted you said you didn't mention shouting at them. No, (laughs) no, I definitely speak at a, a level tone. Don't yeah. assume that a person living with dementia has a hearing problem. Some may. Yeah, but again, yeah. that's that individual experience. I say that a little bit tongue in cheek because it, we often talk about ageism, of course, mm-hmm. and our assumptions and, and all of the stigma that goes with dementia. What are some of the ways that you go about addressing stigma? And how are you looking at the long term? How do we inform and build that awareness and address stigma, which is institutional, it's societal, I noticed you guys talk about the workforce, education, and sustainability. Maybe you could just paint that for us a little bit. So with Dementia Friendly Canada, our three main goals have been to train Canada's workforce to be dementia friendly, which is why we built that online education. Because we know learning a little bit more and learning those simple communication tips, the simple changes you can make really encourages people to learn more and to keep taking those steps forward and to really think about dementia in a different light. Our second one was to promote and educate the general public about dementia. And that's because awareness around dementia is one of the best ways to combat stigma. So we do have a number of public service announcements and little short videos on our website that display easy communication strategies, ways that you can recognize if someone's living with dementia. And then our third goal is really to achieve sustainability and grow this across the country. And one of the ways we do that, again, through awareness is by putting people with lived experience 
at the forefront. So we recently had our uh -huh. Dementia Friendly Communities Awards. It was our inaugural event on January 15th and it still lives online on the webpage if you'd like to go check it out. But we were able to hear from people living with dementia who were nominated for our Dementia Friendly Voice Award about what a dementia friendly community means to them and how that they're making changes out in the community as well as different municipalities, businesses, organizations, groups, care partners who are all speaking and sharing and telling their stories. I think hearing directly from individuals right. is the best way to combat stigma. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, are you seeing any signs of hope? Any examples of how you've seen the ability to make change in community or to bring positive change for people living with dementia and their caregivers through the program that you're doing? Absolutely. I think within my roles at the Alzheimer's Society of BC, I've been able to work with municipalities directly and create dementia-friendly action plans. And I remember I was working with one municipality and I was an individual working in recreation. And on day one, they're like, we're never going to be able to have classes for people living with dementia. There's too much liability. There's too much work. It's too much effort. And within the next few months of learning about dementia, learning about ways to incorporate people living with dementia in their courses, they were starting intergenerational choirs that featured people living with dementia. Wow, they is were, that ever cool? Right, like to see that change and those aha moments for people is really, really exciting and really important. What do you think we can do as Canadians for people working in municipalities or community safe spaces and so on? What can we do to be more aware, more supportive and inclusive of people with dementia and, and how can we get involved? Absolutely. It, it sounds simple, but it's learning those small communication strategies. It's knowing that small changes make a big difference. And you can learn about those small changes by visiting alzheimer.ca slash Dementia Friendly Canada. And even just taking part in a couple modules on the course, watching those uh. PSAs, picking up little tips that you can incorporate into your day to day life and sharing them. I think, again, we talk about the stigma. It's because we're not talking about dementia enough. I think we need to talk about right. dementia with our family and our friends and be open and ready to share tips and tricks. Fantastic. Barbara, I just wanted to make sure we had a moment here. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, no, that Heather? was so interesting, Heather. And it's hard for me to think of anybody, at least in my world, my sphere of work and my social sphere, my family sphere, to think of anybody who hasn't had a fairly direct experience of a loved one, a family member, a neighbor or a friend uh, living with dementia. But, you know, I know they're also out there, people who are clueless, I guess, for lack of a better word, or who just, you know, live in maybe a bit of a bubble and they're not tuned in because they haven't had that direct experience or perhaps they have. Have, but there's still strong stigma attached or fallacies. They don't have the information and they haven't sought out the information that would be really helpful for them to be more, not just aware, but more welcoming and inclusive of the people living with dementia. How do we reach those people? That's a great point. I really appreciate the, the beginning of your statement where we a lot of us have been touched by this. And a lot of times that's the key that grabs on. I worked with a contractor once who said, you never see a Honda Civic on the road until you want to buy a Honda Civic. And then it's every car you see. And it really related and rang true with me for dementia. You don't necessarily think about dementia until someone you know is affected by it. So I think really what we need to do when we're reaching out to people is if we have our own stories, we need to share those and we need to promote them. Outside of my own work, I'm really excited to see a lot of media also talking about dementia in a really positive light. There's a commercial out now where it's not for dementia, it isn't about dementia, but the mother's living with dementia and it's just seen as a great part of life for her to be able to remain active in her community and to use this product and to engage. And, and we're seeing in TV real stories about what it's like to live with dementia. So sometimes even just using the arts or media, mm. a great play out here in BC was recently done by a care partner who was telling his story. So just different ways to to keep spreading the message, I think is how we're going to hit people who aren't directly affected by it. And I loved your example of the choir. I, I just can visualize that. I think that's just so wonderful. And from our end, a lot of the work that I've been doing in the last few years has been with men's sheds and supporting the development of, of men's sheds throughout BC and connecting with Health Page Canada around supporting the expansion or helping to activate the men's shed movement right across the country. And one of the things that I was really excited to see was that a few of the men's sheds are really trying to reach out and engage 
engage other men, men who have dementia in their community. Mm -hmm. There's one in Maple Ridge that really, they got started with the intention of having that focus. And for listeners who don't know, men's sheds are really all about men connecting shoulder to shoulder. You know, we know that at a lot of seniors programs, community centers, that it's mostly women, but men's sheds are those safe spaces for men to connect with each other. So it really helps address isolation, particularly as men age and life changes for them. But they also do a lot of community projects where they partner with different community organizations. So I think there's a lot more possibilities there. And it would be exciting to see that kind of shed that has that focus or creates a partnership with an organization that's supporting people with dementia to really look at how that can be replicated in other parts of the country. So it's just great to see community based organizations incorporating people living with dementia because there's simple things you can do to make your men shed, your choir, your recreation class dementia friendly, if you're leading a fitness class. All it takes is, again, slowing down that class, being cognizant of who's in the room, making sure that the steps you're providing for them as they follow your, can you tell I don't go to a lot of workout classes? You're following the fitness instructor <laughs> along. They can provide the instruction step by step. So there's lots of ways to incorporate people living with dementia into the activities that we're doing. And I love the choir too, particularly because of the intergenerational component. We know how big music is and we know how important it is for younger people to start learning about these things because that also addresses stigma. If you're talking about dementia at a young age, it, you don't have that stigma. It's just something mm -hmm. that you know about. It's something that's part of life. Just as you were both talking, uh, it also reminded me how we know that the crippling effects of isolation and loneliness for older people and how it quickens the onset in many cases of dementia and, and Alzheimer's for that matter. Do you address that specifically or um, ways to really encourage or find ways to allow people to be more socially connected? Yeah, I think by working directly with people who work in places like your local restaurant, like working with servers and providing education to that local coffee shop that a person's always attended is a really right. good step. And I think that's because, again, it normalizes what dementia is amongst people and it allows a person to never have to stop going to that coffee shop they always enjoyed, to never have to stop taking part in that fitness class that they always enjoyed, at least in the early stages or even if they need a care partner to go with them, they can remain active in things that they love because the person right. you know, has individual likes and needs I'm never going to want to stop going to my local coffee shop. So I'm hopeful that they have the tools and tricks they need if I were to ever be living with dementia. Well, Heather, it's been just amazing talking to you and hearing about this work. It's so topical. As we go to, I think it's 2036, we're looking at one in four people in the world are going to be over the age of 65. People are living longer. We're going to be living with dementia and Alzheimer's for, for many years ahead. And we really need to get ahead of the curve. And it's really inspiring to meet you as somebody so impassioned and really engaging this issue straight on. So thank you so much for taking some time with us today and all the best to you and the great work you're doing. Yes. And again, thank you so much for having me. It's been great to be able to talk about this and share some of the work that's happening across the country to really create a dementia-friendly Canada. For those of you who don't know, the website for the Alzheimer Society of Canada is alzheimer.ca, so A-L-Z-H-E-I-M-E-R dot C-A, and you can hear about all of the amazing work that they're doing there. Yeah, thank you, Heather. That was so informative and inspiring. And I would love to hear more stories from you, more great examples of choirs and other uh, dementia-friendly activities and uh, engagement in our communities right across the country. And we can share those on healthyagingcore.ca. So let's stay in touch. You encourage your community, Heather, to apply to the Seniors Can Grants with Help Age Canada for innovative programming that addresses isolation and loneliness for older people. So if you know communities that are trying to get a choir off the ground and need yes. that little extra support, that's the grant that they can go and apply to at helpagecanada.ca. Perfect. I'll be sure to share the message. And thank you again for having me. And I'll definitely be back to share more stories. Right on. Well, that's a wrap for today, everyone. Look forward to seeing you.